Well, look, welcome. Thank you Thank very you, much, Leon. Great um, to be here. It's a yeah, look, it's a pleasure for you to be able to make some time to come in and and have a chat and um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into parliamentarian, Leon Bignall, and and uh, you were previous to that ABC reporter? Yeah, well, I actually worked for a few different uh, news organisations, so yep. I, I always go back to when I was thirteen and I sat down with my grandfather and my great uncle, and they're you know doing the normal things that. Uh, you know, the older generation does. What are you going to do when you leave school? And I said, when I leave school, I'm going to be a journalist and I'm going to go into Parliament. So uh, I wow. sort of... Uh, did, That's pretty ambitious. ...did the things that uh, I said I'd do. And it's kind of weird, and I always say this to the kids, you know, at uh, at uh, graduations and in the contact that I have with them, you know, the only person who can take away your dreams and ambitions is you. Like, yep. And I had plenty of kids through school who were saying, I'm better at English than you, so I'm going to be a journalist and everything else. And I just, yeah, whatever. Um, you just stick to what it is that you want. You have that determination. You be nice to people, and uh, you you learn, and yeah. um, and you and you and you work well. And you do, you know, when you start out. And I started as a copy boy at the old Adelaide News in 1984, straight from school. I did three days work experience, and they gave me a job. And you know, you had to make people's cups of coffee. You had to go and get the yep. cigarettes. You know, some of those blokes smoked five packets a day. Really? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Man, that's what, a hell of a lot of cigarettes. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> Imagine how much that would cost these days. Oh, unbelievable, wouldn't it? I mean. It was just a different a different era. It was a fun era, though. And I've got to say, yep. I didn't go to universities. I learnt on the job from, you know, instead of having one lecturer, you had, what, 80 to 100 journos who yep. were of varying ages and abilities and everything else. And if you pick up the best things from, from all of them, then at, you, you learn along the way. But you also just do everything, every menial job, do it well, do it with a smile, yep. and then they'll ask you to do something else. And then That's something right. Else, I isn't mean, it? people want to deal with people. Yeah. There's nothing worse yeah. than having to go to work and there's yeah. somebody that you just cannot stand yeah. and you have to deal with them and you go, oh, fucking hell, this is terrible. What the hell is going on here? Yeah. If you're a if you're a nice person, yeah. if you're able to do the job, yeah. if you're able to make sure that you go bang, 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 yeah. it's all done. There's no worries, then yeah. you're, you're going to get far. And if you're enthusiastic, I, I, I feel it as a, as a young fella coming through and now I, I, I see it in young people coming through that if you're enthusiastic and you show some now some ambition and everything else yep. people just take you under their wing you know absolutely they want you they want to see you thrive you know? it's addictive it's addictive. It is, isn't people's it? people's passion is an addictive thing it is something that um i i think that everybody is driven essentially by passion yep. whether if it's if, if it's on the positive or the negative side i mean yep. people get very passionate about yep. things and if you can put that into the positive you can put that into positive make other people feel good yep. make other people look good yep. then they're going to want to be involved with you Exactly. They're going to want to come along yeah. with you. So. And, I, and a great example of that was last week. We had a meeting in um, McLaren Vale. Yep. We had 500 people turn up for that meeting, and it was all about, you know, the the legislation that we locked in six years ago to protect the townships in the McLaren Vale area. So McLaren yep. Flat, McLaren Vale, Wollonga. Now, everyone was on the same side of the, the debate. We got everyone in the room. Well, actually, 200 were outside listening on the speakers yep. and um, 300 inside. And it was a fun meeting. And we ran it like a fringe show almost. Yeah. Um, and you had people there of all ages. You had kids right through to probably people in their 90s. Well, I know um, Derry Osborne was there, and he's 91, 92. Yep. And, um, you know, there was just... The, and, I, and I sort of started the meeting saying, look, you know, I feel like I'm at a Neil Diamond concert. Hello to all the tree people um, because of this 200 people outside. But no one was whinging about it. I said, let's just make it a short meeting. Let's get it underway yeah, get it and, and get it done and... in 45 minutes. Yep. And um, there wasn't any whinging and whining and boring questions and everything else. It was just this passion. And I wasn't there bagging anyone either. You know, I said, look. Did anybody stand up and start chanting monorail, monorail? No, no, monorail. no, no. There was none oh, of that. Man. But Cause that. I really want to see that at like a council <laughs> meeting or in parliament or something like that. I, I love that side of the passion as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there, there was some, someone actually said, you know, I think we should be marching on parliament. I said, well, hang on. You've got the Greens on board. You've got Labor on board. And the Liberal Party 
which is the new government, they look mm. like they're on board as well. So why yeah. would we go why and, would you and beat them up? Yeah. Like when they've just got a decision to make and just by turning up here tonight, by signing the petition, and, yeah. and, and I've been to see Stefan Canole, who's the planning minister. I sat down with Stephen Marshall yesterday, who's the premier. You know, they get it. They know. Yeah. And you can get a lot more done through collaboration and conflict, I reckon. You and, know? and actually, I did read the letter that you had um, that you had put forward to Stephen Marshall. Yeah. And that was probably one of the big things at, at, at probably three quarters of the way through that letter that you had said, look, I've been elected. I'm in this area, but I don't want to argue with people. I want yeah. to work with people. I want to collaborate with people, and I want the best for the people that are, is in my my area. And I think that's that's a huge thing. It, it it does seem to me, and this is from the outside looking in, but it does seem to me that a lot of the time that we concentrate on, I am the opposition, or mm. I am against whatever this other party kind of says. So I need to disagree with those people, mm. and it is such a it's just argumentative for mm. argument's sake. It's mm. it's um, it's not productive for for what generally people want in their own place, and and I think people respect that. I yeah. think and look, it, it's certainly why I thought, hey, I'm going to ask Leon to, to come on and have a chat because it's something that is a bit more open. It's not. Um, I, I wouldn't put you in the traditional politician's um, jacket. Um, it's it's open to all ideas. Uh, doesn't matter where they come from. So. How, how did that come about that there was a new um, uh, proposal, I guess, to, to restructure the boundaries within that area? Well, so we took this legislation through six years ago and someone at the time said, look, we should have a review mechanism in there for five years. Yep. So it's not the present government's fault. That was in there yep. um, and that had to be done. So what, um, because there could have been some anomaly or something like that, but what we you know focused on at the meeting last week is what do we want to get out of this? What What's the message we want to get to the new government? And it was... We don't want any changes to the boundaries and we don't want any further review mechanisms put in. So yep. the only way this legislation can be changed in the future is if both Houses of Parliament agree to do it. So, right. you know, I, I think anyone who did that would realise that it's political suicide down in, in our oh, part of absolutely. the world. Absolutely. You because know? no one goes to suburbia for holidays. And no. if you have McLaren Vale and Wollonga or McLaren Flat all join up, it's just going to look like any other suburb. Yep. The other thing is we it's really fertile ground. And since the early 60s, we've lost so much of our agricultural lands between... Do you know how much you have lost? Well, basically, if you got in your car and drove from the CBD to Elizabeth and um, up into Athelston and down mm -hmm. through Marion and um, a, a, all the way down to sort of Aldinga and Selix Beach, we've lost, you know, suburb after suburb full of... Uh, prime agricultural land where wow. we used to have um, you know glass houses uh, all, all through Fulham all through Campbelltown um, yep. you know Marion they used to grow grapes there for wine there's even some old uh, vineyards that were at Glenelg so yep. you know we have lost a lot of our, our arable land and if you keep building houses on it where are we going to get our food from we're gonna have to import it and and I think there's a there's an argument for what the city of Adelaide is trying to achieve and, and trying to bring people into a CBD, into a city setting and stop an urban sprawl as such and and putting putting facilities where people need facilities and stopping where people just want to develop to uh, suffice their own business, to suffice their own agendas. Um, and if we keep doing that, we're, we're really going to lose the charm. I mean, imagine if they just went out to Tanunda and just started chucking up bloody hotels left, right and centre. It's... Um, it's a world-renowned place. McLaren Bale is a world-renowned place. It's a producer. It's not a, um, like you say, you don't go to holidays in the suburbs. Yeah. There's nobody going, you know what, I reckon I'm going to go down to Campbelltown. I'm going to have a week in Campbelltown. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> you know what they, they have got in Campbelltown, though, is an excellent food trail. There's all these um, magnificent small uh, producers through there that do gelati, do cakes, yeah. do cheeses, and everything else. And there's actually the um, city of Campbelltown, and Great Council has actually put up the, I think it's called the Campbelltown Food Trail. If you Google it, and you can actually just go out there and go from uh, company to company and just yeah, try right. all this amazing food. So they have got this um, amazing sort of food culture there yep. that we probably don't even realise it's there. Most people don't realise it's there, but uh, and that's another awesome. thing. There's a lot of things that go on, and and which intrigues me now. I'm getting old, um, <laughs> but there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that you don't necessarily see, and there's a lot of um, to and fro and back and forth, and um, you know development and uh, foresight, yeah. foresight into how we're going to develop as as a state, as yeah. a as a city. Um, how how do you find your position now? compared to, uh, what, six, eight months ago. Yeah. Um, 
Well, yeah, the election. A big change. The election was in March. It was a big change. I didn't realise how fast the um, treadmill was going. You know, for yep. five years as a minister, and I had agriculture, food, fisheries, forest, tourism, you had everything, recreation, sport, and racing, and and racing. Yeah. You're the minister for racing. And, and now, everyone, no offence, Leon. It doesn't look like you've run won a race lately. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made weight for about fifteen years. You know, we. Uh, I wouldn't get a job as a jockey, but. Um, and, and, and Jay and everyone used to call me the Minister for Fun. And yep. it's actually hard work to make stuff like that look like fun. Yeah. But, you know, they're the, they're the important portfolios. I mean, they're, they're not more important than health and education, but they're important in the sense of job creation and they're important in the sense of bringing money into our state. So through exports, through getting tourists here, and I always say that the best money we can have in our state is the money out of the pockets and handbags and wallets of people from interstate and overseas. Absolutely. So we saw tourism grow from $4.9 billion to seven point, uh, $6.7 billion in the five years I was tourism minister, for example. So that doesn't happen by accident. You've actually got to be out there getting China Southern to fly direct, getting Qatar yep. to fly direct, uh, building the Adelaide Oval and the, the convention center. So providing that infrastructure, which then leads to hotels and private yeah. sector investment. So hotels go up, more jobs there. So we created a whole lot of jobs in that uh, visitor economy and also in the agriculture, food and wine sector. So, But what I didn't realise until I stopped doing it was just how little time I'd had for myself, how little time I'd had yep. for the family and, and stuff like that. And to be honest, I probably still haven't freed up as much time as I should for some of the nearest <laughs> and dearest as in my life. As much time as the uh, family would like. Yeah, but what I, it's been a complete... Uh, focus now on my electorate because you know after the election I'm thinking right now I've been the minister for five years now I've got to be the shadow minister you know and be the one in there having the arguments and everything else yep. and then I, I took a break over Easter we went down to Hobart I caught up with Will Hodgman who's the the liberal premier down there he's a good mate of mine because he was a tourism minister as well so yep. we've been good mates for about five years I, was, I caught up with him and then I, I suddenly thought I don't actually have to be in the shadow ministry I can just wind it all back and just be a good strong local member and my yep. seat had completely changed i lost woodcroft and onkaparinga hills and huntfield heights and old nolunga and i picked up that was through the reshuffle of boundaries yeah and so like and it that. was massive yeah. and i was hit the hardest with that well actually i shouldn't say hardest i had the biggest swing so i went my seat which i'd built from a three and a half percent liberal seat to a five and a half percent labor seat yep. suddenly went to a four and a half percent liberal seat it was the ninth safest seat up the liberal side of the pendulum and everyone said you couldn't win it and um so I picked, did that give you motivation though? yeah absolutely. you can't win that absolutely oh, yeah watch me uh, so i was sitting in cabinet <laughs> i was sitting in cabinet when this this decision came through and jay said geez biggles you're uh, and i can't say the word on the <laughs> on, on the microphone but it was a uh, you know i was Yep. Yeah, yeah, you're in a in a pretty tough place. You're in a pickle. And and I looked at it and uh, I said, I reckon I've picked up about 15 new bakeries, six pubs, uh, at least two breweries, a distillery. I said, where's the downside in that? He goes, just that 10% swing against you. But look, the area, I, I'm so blessed because I've got McLaren Vale, McLaren F uh, Flat, Wollonga, um, Port Wollonga, Aldinga, Selix, all the way down through my Ponga and Yankalilla to Cape Jervis and Kangaroo Island. And I mean, Kangaroo Island, oh, yeah. It's just amazing. It is it is so good. And, you know, the, the, these people there, they'd been taken for granted by both sides of politics. I went to my yep. Ponga, and, you know, we all know my Ponga. It's the place you drive through on the way to somewhere. Yep. And I said to him, I said, I reckon this is the place that everyone, every politician of all persuasions has driven through. No one's ever stopped to talk to you. And they go, yeah, yeah exactly right. So I found out they didn't have a playground there. They wanted a playground. So we lobbied. We got some money for a playground. It's one of the wettest places in South Australia, and they had a grass bowling ring that when all the visiting teams would come, their bowls would only go Just halfway down them. the thing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And when these guys went to play at uh, Victor or somewhere else, all yeah. theirs would end up They're in the gutter. <laughs> so, you know, two weeks ago, we were down there opening this new green that we promised in the lead up yep. to the election. So... It's just a matter of getting out, talking to people, and having a bit of fun. You know, these people. I was born and bred on a dairy farm down in the southeast. No one in my family's ever voted Labor, except Dad, for three times for Des Corcoran, who was the Labor minister, and he ended up being the Labor premier. But um, Dad always said about Des, he goes, "He's a good bloke who works hard for our area." So that's been yep. my mantra. Just yep. get out there, be a good bloke. So I went down to the Parowa and uh, to talk to the, the farmers down there and handed out the 60-year service medals to them for being part of the Parowa Ag Group. And um, I got up and said, good evening, comrades. It's great to be here, you know. <laughs> and they're all I like this because it's such blue ribbon liberal thing. But yep. by the end of the night, you know, they're having a bit of a laugh. I said, look, the party secretary sends his kindest regards, comrades, because uh, this... This uh, this booth of Parowa, which only has 120 votes in it, we tripled our vote. We went from seven votes 
to 21 votes for the Labor Party. So <laughs> we see that we're getting you one comrade at a time. You know, and just have a bit of fun. And how, just how long have you been a Labor Party member? Uh, since 2001. I was working for the ABC, as you said. So I'd, I'd yep. sort of worked for the news, then the advertiser, then Channel uh, Brisbane Sun for six months, then Channel 7, back to the news, Channel 10, two years living in Switzerland as a journo, then five years with the ABC. And I'd just finished doing the Olympics and I was a little bit going, what am I going to do now? Yep. And out of the blue, the Labor Party rang me up and uh, offered me a job. And interestingly, before I went to Switzerland, I'd applied for a job with Dean Brown, who was opposition leader and about to become Premier yep. after the State Bank thing. So I guess it just sort of shows that as a journo, I was pretty much straight down, uh, down the middle. middle. Yep. But I've always wanted to do the right thing. And I thought after that State Bank uh, disaster, I wanted to get in as a young fella and help the, the, the then Liberal government that was about to come in, help them get the state back on its feet and yep. uh, and help, you know, get get Dean Brown presenting himself as, as as maybe a little bit more charismatic than what he turned out to be. But so you were a Labor, moment. You, you, you were a Labor member from 2001, yep. but I've done some stalking, right? Yep. So I, 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 I was looking, I think, at your Instagram or something like that, and I, I went all the way back, all the way back. Yep. And uh, the, probably the, the coolest picture that I found was um, uh, yourself, I think maybe your dad, and Bob Hawke. Yeah, no, Dad wasn't in there. It was a photographer from the Tizer. That was 1987. We are in the Brompton Park Hotel, yep. and um, we were standing there with Hawkey. That was the day that Hawkey came over with Mick Young, who was the federal member for uh, Port Adelaide, and he was uh, immigration minister. Great, great character, like a, a sheep shearer um, who'd gone to China in the 50s, you know, as a union delegate. Yeah, right. Then, and then got off to get to China and meet uh, Mao before Nixon did. So yep. a, a great man, a very funny man, you know, real... Great sense of humor, real personality. So, um, Mick's son um, had the Brompton Park Hotel. So, um, Bob and Mick were there with Kim Beasley, who was Defence Minister, yep. announcing the Collins class submarines were going to be built in South Australia. So, it was a massive story. Yeah. And I was really good mates with Janine Young. Uh, she was a photographer. So, I was kind of given the inner sanctum treatment. <laughs> and, um, you know, Mick always used to say, because I'd stay with him in, at his place in Sydney when he moved over there. And um, so, we were there and we got this great photo with Bob and. Um, it's uh, it, it was a great day, but Mick Mick was j just such a character, and uh, we'd be sitting there, and Paul Keating had come around to his house or something like this, and he'd always say, you know, Biggles is the only journalist who's ever going to be allowed to stay in my house, and all this sort of stuff. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. That was a good rap. But one one morning he got up to go for his run down at Bondi, and he just goes, Biggles, what's all these big lizards doing on my steps? I said, yep. and I just I just walked in five o'clock in the morning from the cross or wherever we'd been. <laughs> and uh, I said, they're not bloody lizards, they're iguanas. And he goes, where'd you get that? I said, from the iguana bar. Every drink you got at this cocktail, they stuck one on the side of your drink and I'd ended up with pockets full of them, you know? Yep. And um, uh, he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm just going to get some sleep. He goes, no, you're not. You're coming for a run down to Bondi. So I went down there and we're running along uh, Bondi Beach and around the Bronte and everyone knew Mick. Like, yeah. the, those those crims that you sort of uh, find out later on, yeah, who were yep. to, who were a bit crooked and stuff like that. Yep. Then the the big high court judges, everyone, was, g'day Mick, g'day Mick, as you as you were. <laughs> but you know, I, I I kind of lament the fact that we've lost a few of those characters, and and you know the the people who would sort of just say it as they saw it. Yeah, yeah. And look, I mean, there there is still a I guess a um a version of that. That, that we see now, but I think the availability of information and the way that information can spread so quickly or go viral and all those things are, uh, is very immediate and there's no take back. There isn't a thing where you can say something now and go, oh, fuck, actually, mm -hmm. I actually meant this and, and reiterate what you what you said because everything just goes out so quickly. It's over the internet. It's at every single point that um, is either to your advantage or disadvantage and people dissect every word of what you say. Some of what's lost in that is the intonation behind it and the feeling behind it. And, you know, if you can sit there and, and you know, and, and you can't say this right now, but I can say like, oh, for fuck's sake, that's bullshit. Now, if I said that in your position, I'd be in trouble. And uh, if, if, if I wanted to really put my uh, passionate side forward, and I, and I think some of that got, got, left with, um, got left with Paul Keating, who had a, a vicious tongue and, and, a, and, a, and a slight of word, but do you, do you see that ever coming back into politics? Do you see that stand up and say, look, mate, you, this is actually a problem in my area. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm not going to stand for whatever you're bloody saying to me. Is, is that something that's going to come back? Is that... I think so. You've, you've got to have a certain honesty about you, and you've got to be... People can see, see if you're not 
you know genuine being genuine yeah and if you come on here or you go on to a you know do an interview somewhere and you're not saying exactly the same thing that you're saying to the blokes sitting next to you at the front bar of the yeah. alma hotel in Wollonga, then you get called out as being a bit of a fraud you know yep. so um i i love just being who i am and yep. i really sort of relax into it and have a have a joke and it was funny because before the last election you know i'm in a four and a half percent liberal seat the, the, yeah. the seat that everyone said you couldn't win the libs went through my Facebook and Insta stuff. Now, I, I just get out and have fun. I'm just loose, you know? Yeah. And um, so I'd put this photo up on New Year's Eve a couple of years ago, and I, I'd taken a catch the year before at the uh, at the at the Big Bash. Cricket. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember and, uh, seeing in that. The crowd. It, it Bloody good catch, it, Well, too. it might have bounced off an awning and a seat, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's I carried on. The way. <laughs> it was the biggest It was the biggest celebration of the season. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Ricky Ponning was doing the commentary, and he said, look at that bloke there in the suit. He's... Uh, he's um, He's just come down from work and uh, the ball's bounced about three times. He's carrying on like he took the catch of the year. So it was funny. But anyway, so the next week or it might have been the, the next season, I said, right, I'm here. I'm ready for a catch. And I don't normally go to the cricket in my suit. I've just sort of gone down there straight after Parliament. Yep. And uh, so uh, this next time I'm there in my normal attire, which is the um, striker's uh, shirt and a KFC bucket hat. Yep. Um, on my uh, on my head and a, and a beard and so I put this post up just saying can't wait for a catch I'm going halves with this uh, this seven year old girl a true story seven year old girl came up because uh, I was walking around going I'm ready for a catch and I was yep. she came up she will you put my bucket um, hat on and then if you take the catch we'll go halves I'm going yeah no worries so I did that on Facebook <laughs> and the liberals take that down they took another one off me of riding a mechanical ball uh, another one um, I was three years in a row the champion wine spitter in McLaren Vale uh, with a, with a spit of a about 5.3, 5.4 metres. That's impressive. It is, you know, hidden talents, and I'm pretty unco, and so I was happy to get a trophy, first one in my life, except that time I came last in a golf tournament. In fact, every time that I came last in a golf tournament. <laughs> so, yeah, they took them off, and they tried to discredit me with these photos and just saying, oh, he's just, he's got to grow up, he's just, all my mates are just going, that's the best endorsement you can get. Well, you know? uh, that's what I was about to yeah. say. I mean, and, and that's, uh, that's where I think that people sometimes miss the point within what is um, the difference between being able to be personable and being mm. professional. Yeah. And there's, there's a time. There's it, a time and a place. Yeah. And, and for something like the cricket, when a seven-year-old little kid comes up to you and says, hey, mate, wear my bloody chicken bucket yeah. on your head and give this a crack. Yeah. That's the time to be personable. Well, That's you don't have to sit there and be as stiff as all hell and have the no. carrot up your butt and yeah. and and oh sorry, there might be a photo taken of me looking like yeah. a fucking idiot. I took the photo. I put it on there. <laughs> like, this is the crazy thing. It was me. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. And and I wasn't up with the libs. They were all with their suit and tie in the committee room. Yeah. You know, yeah. talking to uh themselves. Uncle Fester, you know. <laughs> so would you would you consider that that it actually did help you with it? Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just, I mean, they're the they're the images that I put on my Facebook and my Insta. So people are just used to seeing me being real, and it's yep. really funny because and then someone will have a crack at me, and I'll have a crack back. Yep. And um, some of my colleagues just go, I don't know how you get away with that. You know, I don't know. Yeah, in a in a fun way that I think. And even Jay used to just like shake his head. Some of the some of the things that I would say and stuff <laughs> like that. Is Jay after his blood? Jay's good. broken leg. Yeah, he's good. He's broken leg or yeah, broken arm. Broken leg. Yeah. Um, he was up in the Flinders doing his uh, bushwalk, and uh, he had to get carried out by uh, poor bastard. Oh, yeah. Honestly, poor lot bastard. Of pain, lot lose of pain. the lose the election. The yeah. first thing that comes in, in yeah. big news, big news. Yeah. He's gone out to the Flinders. He's fucking stacked it. He's oh, broken no. his leg. Fuck. I thought, Jesus Christ. Yeah. You couldn't get a worse bloody story. I mean. No. And after all those years of just like you know not getting that much time off, he's out there yeah. with Mel, his wife, and his daughters, and stuff yeah. like that, and. Um, then they end up getting the uh, the bonus chopper ride home. So um, and did they pay for the chopper ride, or is this going to be a Bromham Bishop? I think, Bro I think Bromham was the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I think her, her, beehive, her beehive got caught in the rotors there for a bit. But um, you yeah, know, it was, uh, and I know that he personally went and thanked all of those. You know, they were, they were just people, fellow bushwalkers who helped yep. who helped get him out, and along with the local SES and uh, the ambulance people and the police, everyone just, you know. Came in and did such a really good job. So. Yeah, but he's yeah. he's good, JG. I tell you, he was a good leader too. You know, yeah. he was uh, he he was he was always sort of that quiet, unassuming guy. But he was he was ruthless in many ways, and, yeah. and I don't mean ruthless in in, a, in an egotistical way for him. He was ruthless in making sure he did the very best he could for the state. Now things are always going to go wrong, and we can concentrate on the things that went wrong. But I was sitting around that cabinet table, and I saw when things needed to get done, and the right thing needed to get done. Yeah. He was the bloke you wanted to be on the team with, you know. 
Well, and and that I mean, in in the news at the moment, there's there's a couple of headlines that just confuse me a little bit. And the first one is the um, the diesel generators. Mm. So diesel generators is blown out at six hundred million dollars, and mm. I, I don't recall what it was supposed to be. I think it was two hundred million dollars or something. I think like five hundred or something like that. But yeah, but, okay, yeah. yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's blown out. When don't things blow out in this day mm. and age? These things happen. Um, nobody addressed the reason why that we thought spending that amount of money on diesel generators was a good idea in mm. the first place. They, they just concentrate on, it's not exactly what you told me. Mm-hmm. And now we're talking about selling it. What the fuck would we spend all that money, even if it was more than what we thought mm. in the first mm. place, why would we spend all that money? No one said it's a bad idea mm. now, but we just say it's too much, so we reckon we're going to sell them. Why would we now sell that infrastructure? It, it's it's a supportive infrastructure to what the whole of South Australia needs. It's complementary to what we've invested into batteries, what we've invested into renewable energy, and and people that uh, say you know, but we're selling coal to the Chinese and we're selling coal to these people, and and why do they get cheap power and we don't? There's a balance. Mm. There's there's a book. There, it it does have to balance and yeah. it does have to work. And if we can make that work in the uh, in the environment's way, which I think is pretty obvious to everybody, it will work within our sustainability and our impact on our on our earth. Yeah. Why why wouldn't we invest that money? Yeah. Well, uh, look, and it's really easy to see. And yeah, you know, the coroner is a good example, isn't he? The coroner always looks at the world through with twenty twenty vision. Yep. And so and so should have done this, and so and so should have done this, and this should have been in place, and that shouldn't be in place. But when you're out fighting a bushfire or something like that, you don't always have the twenty twenty. Uh, perspective, yeah. you know, uh, the vision of uh, uh, taking a, a retrospective look or working out what what could have been done better. That, but th- this review was also done by an eminent jurist and um, uh, who's a fine legal mind. He's a QC and um, not taking anything away from him. But the energy market is a really weird place yeah. where they have their own language, they have their own behaviours that are quite often counterintuitive to what you would think you would do. Um, you know, Sometimes they withhold energy so they can drive up the prices uh, that they're going to get from one of their other assets and things like that. So you're not playing in a market that acts necessarily responsibly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not acting in a market that uh, acts in a way that us lay people would think it should work in terms of supply and demand. So. We go back to September, the year before last, when we had that statewide blackout. We had seven tornadoes hit down on our state that yeah, day, yeah. including a twin tornado. That was a crazy day. It was that amazingly was crazy day. And my memories of that, uh, being at Parliament, we were on standby because it was going to be, you know, the, the warnings were all there. That I yep. mean, that front that went through the mid-north, I mean, it was bad enough in Adelaide that day. But if that had have gone through... Adelaide instead of the mid north, we would have lost dozens of lives probably. Yep. You know, yep. so we were sitting around the cabinet table having our emergency cabinet meeting, and you've got the, the commissioner of police, you've got the bureau of meteorology, you've got everyone in there explaining what's going on, and you're the ones tasked with making the best decisions you can at that time. And I have two memories of that night. One is the professional way that we went around things that happen and then watching the social media of having people saying wow we're talking to our kids we're playing uno we've got the candles yeah. out and it's actually really good. so that was the reality of what was yeah. happening yeah then we had these people the prime minister of our country malcolm turnbull at the time nick xenophon and barnaby joyce who were racing into studios while we were trying to get the lights back on and we were trying to make sure that our citizens were safe we just had a disaster. You know, Queensland gets hit by cyclones. All these parts, Darwin gets yep. hit by cyclones. We get hit by seven tornadoes and people want to kick the shit out of us yep. because the power went out. Like, the power started coming on within two hours. Yep. But they couldn't flick a switch and get it all back on at once or it would have crashed the system. So yep. you had to bring it on bit Gradually. by bit. Yep. But by 10 o'clock that night, we had a lot of people back on. By one o'clock, you know, a lot more were back on. I think Port Lincoln, there was some thing that triggered over there that meant that they were off for a few days. But yep. it, it, it wasn't... A, a big disaster in terms of loss of life mm-hmm. um, but but these people who sat outside our state just wanted to kick the shit out of us because they had a particular view on renewable energy yeah. and as it turned out they were found to be in the wrong with the claims yeah. that they'd made including Nick Xenophon and we should never ever forget that Nick Xenophon who was then a senator for South Australia was there joining in the chorus of the bully boys kicking the guy who's laying on the ground and needs needs help. Now, yep. 
That's when the Prime Minister of your country, any leader, steps in, gets on the phone and says, what is it that we can do to help? I Absolutely, took, yeah. I, took, I took a photo in that cabinet meeting of Jay on the phone to Malcolm Turnbull. Yep. You know Malcolm Turnbull never rang Jay back? He Serious? never rang him back. When a Premier of a state rings the Prime Minister and explains what's going on, he never got a phone call back. And then he waltzed into town a few days later and sort of walked through flooded areas out near Virginia. Pretty disgraceful, pretty disgraceful leadership, I reckon. Yeah. It doesn't matter what colour your politics are. When fellow countrymen or members of your state are in trouble, you just put the hand out and offer assistance. If there's going to be recriminations, we're all human you do beings. It, you do it we're down the track. We're all human beings, and we're all we're all coming from the same yeah. spot where we want to be safe. We want our yeah. our families to be safe. We want the best for you know pretty much everyone. Yeah. Maybe not everyone. There might be one or two stragglers. You go, oh fuck, I wish that guy piss off. <laughs> but um, in general, I mean, yeah. everybody wants the best for for their neighbour. Everybody yeah. wants the best for the bloke down the road, and that is that is absolutely disgusting. It, yeah. it, it is really disappointing, and, and you know, coming from a um, a, a, a side that's outside of that politics, and and I would never say that I've actually been a hundred percent Labor guy or a hundred percent Liberal guy or anything. And and Nick Xenophon was um, what I did see as that in between, and I think a lot of South Australians saw Nick Xenophon as that in between. And I, I remember him riding the little buggy BMW yeah. down the thing and saying, "No pokies, no pokies." I fucking hate pokies. Mm-hmm. That's the one of my pet hates. Mm. I, I love live music and I love people being able to get out Mm. and experience things and I walk past all these places and they're full of fucking pokey machines Mm -hmm. and people are literally just going I am going to die and Mm. clicking clicking buttons I absolutely hate Mm. it and that's one of the attractions of that man but But how many did he get rid of? No, it was all slogan, no substance. It's all increased, and um, and when push comes to shove he's jumping on board with with whoever's the popular opinion and and it's 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 disgusting yeah it really is a an upsetting um uh, side of politics that I don't think we've seen a hell of a lot. I don't think we've seen that too often where yeah. there is that, um, and I hate to use the word shifty, but I'm not that, you know, linguistic, so shifty. Yeah. Between those two major parties, yeah. picking and choosing where he's going to be able to get these votes and do these yeah. things, it, it was really, really disappointing. Yeah. And I was so close to actually putting a, a mark down under his name, and I'm I'm glad that I didn't. Yeah. Um, but but I do think that um, that uh, that approach that he had took more away from what the uh, the old government mm-hmm. had in in terms of, of votes than than what the, uh, the the new government now had. Mm. Um, do you do you see that it that it was a disadvantage to to the Labor government at yeah, that stage? Yeah, I think it was. I think um, when you have a contest between two people, it is um, your idea. Um, my idea and we have the discussion backwards and forwards when you've got a third person popping up it was pretty hard for Jay to sort of reach out and have a go at whatever Stephen Marshall was proposing when you had Nick bobbing up in the middle and that's the first election I've, I've, I've seen or can remember where you actually had you know the, the debates and they're always a feature of elections first time I've ever seen a triple headed debate yep. not just once but every every um, debate had Nick, Jay, and Stephen on it. So yeah. um, it, it, it kind of made it a little hard to prosecute because there was this other noise there. But I think one good thing that came out of it was that you know Nick had been the darling of the media and he'd, uh, yeah. he'd been left with very little scrutiny for 20 odd years. Absolutely. And at this time he came under scrutiny, you know, and I think that was a good thing. And I think it, you know, I've never underestimated the, the nous and the intelligence of voters, you know, because yep. people can say, "Ah, oh, bloody elections!" You know, politicians—they're all the same. But I reckon they get it right. Yeah. And look, you know, we look at us, and we didn't get wiped out. We still won 19 seats. None of our ministers were defeated. I mean, off the back of the the, the worst distribution uh, redistribution that any government or any party has ever suffered, mm-hmm. um, it was it was a, a good result. And I've got to say, after 16 years, let's give these guys a go. You know, and uh, yep. and I, and I like. Peter Malinowskis is our leader. I like his attitude too. He's like, mm-hmm. we may have had these views while we were in government, but we're not in government now. So on a lot of issues, we'll let the government of the day have their way because they won the election. Things like shop trading hours, which was just defeated today, yep. different yep. story. You know, that is something that we want to be on the side of the workers. And I know at Aldinga Foodland, I know at, 
uh, McLaren Vale food lamp. The workers in there, they love their public holidays, you know. Yeah. There's so little time now for people to actually just be with their families. And, you know, I talk to people, particularly over Christmas and stuff like that, where you get that sort of run of public holidays. And you sort of say, are you going to get away? And, um, and and they can't because they work in the city or in, mm-hmm. in retail. They have to be there, but their wife or their husband is going to be with the kids and taking them yep. away. It, it just splits families up. You know, when right. I grew up, we'd jump in the caravan and you'd go away for a couple of weeks. It's just really hard on a 24 7 roster system that we have Mm. the other thing that's hurting is sporting clubs because you can't give that commitment to make training and make games when you're on a seven day absolutely and mate i i've i've um i've spent the majority of my adult life working in a retail situation and i guess i'm um and there'll be a lot of people that i have worked with particularly robbie fucking nice one rob he'll go you're a dickhead mate you are what you're about to say is exactly the opposite of what you think but I, I struggle to see uh, the sense behind uh, the regulation, and I do think that deregulation was a um, uh, possibly a better option for uh, for consumers and for business in South Australia. And, and the reasons I do is, is probably two things majorly, is that people, just because you're open at midnight, doesn't mean that people are going to shop at midnight. Mm. Now, if I own a shop and I'm open at midnight and no one comes in, then I'm just not going to be open at midnight. So our routine and our our, our way of life really does revolve a lot around schedules. Mm. And whether that schedule is your atypical schedule or B typical schedule, and we have a lot of FIFO workers, we mm. have a lot of people that are shift workers, and, and they do not get to go out and, and uh, utilise services because they're shut. Um, it doesn't mean that I have to be open. Hmm. And and that's what I didn't quite understand about the deregulation. If I was down at the IGA and I was working at the Foodland or I was doing whatever and, and, um, and they said to me, well, mate, we're open at midnight, you're going to be paid penalty rates because we're going to be open at midnight. It It's a kind of a defeatist thing where we have a whole a whole bunch of industries, especially in hospitality, that, that don't want to pay penalty rates. And we're not going to be open on this day and this public holiday and blah, 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 because we have to pay people. Wouldn't that same attitude come into, well, I'm not going to be open at midnight because I ain't going to be paying anybody that X amount of dollars more to be open at that time. So we would self-regulate. And but, isn't that a more um, gratuitous way to be able to operate if we are... If I if I live in a place and, and uh, you know, I've got the majority of people, the FIFO workers, and they're available at all hours in their one week off... Mm. And then there's nobody there for two weeks. And then they're flooded in. Shouldn't I be allowed to be open 24 hours a day in that time? Well, the thing is, it's the big guys want to be open all the time. And then they yeah. force the small mum and dad operators to open as well to be competitive. Otherwise, they go to business. So if you look at somewhere like Westfield Marion, yep. um, the big guys in there, Meyer and uh, Woolies and Coles, you know, th- those big sort of multinationals, they want to be open all the time. But how do you go if you're the small franchise owner or the small business owner, and it's only you and your partner, or maybe one or two employees, mm. how do you go staffing that operation, you know, 24 seven, or, you know, more as you want. And the other thing is, if you've got a shop in there, and the shopping center is open, Westfield, yeah, make sure make your, that the shops sure are open, open, you know, so at, at the end of the day, there is that too. At the end of the day, we've only got so much money coming in to oh, spend shit. each week. Tell me about and, it. And I reckon, you know, as <laughs> As someone who lives in McLaren Vale, where we do have things open because there's cellar doors there, yep. and we have, you know, the Onkapringa Gorge, and we have keep going down, you know, we've got Cape Jervis and Rapid Bay and all those wonderful places down the Fleurieu. Don't we want people who visit us to go and visit those areas and not be in shops like the Body Shop and all these multinational shops that they yep. can go and see them in their hometown. Yeah. Get them out. Get them going to sell the doors, buying some wine, so that yep. when they go back to the US or England or wherever they're from, they actually look for that wine from McLaren Vale because they had an amazing time there. Yep. I mean, I reckon it's a pretty sad society that wants to shop 24-7. I reckon it's really oh, sad. I agree with that as well, and, yeah. And I lived in Switzerland for a couple of years and the shops closed at 12. Yep. And they didn't reopen until Monday morning at 8 o'clock. So if you didn't have all your shopping done, you know, too bad. Exactly, you, you missed yeah. out. Um, and and people, people used to say, particularly the Liberal Party, they go, we're a backward state, you know, we're close for business. Okay, Switzerland, pretty well visited country. Yep. Paris, don't have Sunday trading. Shops close 12 o'clock, 
Saturday yeah. unless they're in a tourist zone of uh, Paris, you know, most visited city in the world. So if it's all right for Paris, it's all right for Switzerland, it's all right for these countries. Yeah, we might be able to <laughs> give some people some time off. I, I just sort of think, you know, and, and let's look at who drives this. You know, it's it's the the business arm, the big business arm, because we're yep. there for looking after the small business people. It's the big business people who are running it in cahoots with the Liberal Party that looks after the big end of town. You know, let's. Oh, I tell you what really riled me last year was that campaign by the Liberal Party and Business SA to stop us introducing that bank tax. I mean, have a look at the the scandalous behaviour of those banks. And we knew it was going on before the Royal yeah. Commission, that Royal Commission that the Liberal Party kept denying us yeah, until yeah. finally they were shamed into it. Um, and, and the Liberal Party knocked off that bank tax that we were going to bring in last year, that we could have taken some of that money and given it to small businesses that, that need a helping hand to be innovative. You know, we've got all these, all these small guys and women in this state who are doing amazing things they're world leaders absolutely in, in all sorts of areas absolutely give them a little bit of a bit of cash because the banks won't loan it to them because anything riskier than sort of you know guaranteed uh, mortgage payments from some poor sucker yeah. um, isn't going to be good enough for uh, for these these greedy banks you know, i represent kangaroo island they won't loan money to people on kangaroo island because it's you know got some code in their uh, yeah. in their system that says it's too risky. That flicks so, the switch that just says no yeah. and there's really nothing we can do about yeah, it now. Exactly. So just get off the phone. We don't want to talk yeah. to you. So we'll yeah. be there looking after the small business people and looking after you know the workers who do want to have a break with their family. And um, you know I really just sort of think that we have to remember that big business and their influence within the Liberal Party, their influence within media. Have a look at all the ads that they spend. Yeah, it's not the small yeah. guy who can afford all the ads in newspapers and on TV and on yeah. radio. It's it's the big guys. It's the Westfields and everything else. So, you know, they're sitting around the board table with um, the owners and directors of these media outlets. And I'm not having a crack at the media in this. I'm just explaining what the reality is of where yeah. do these campaigns come from yeah, and, absolutely. And, and who's driving and, and it. And The media, like everybody else, needs an income. Yeah, exactly. They need an income. They need support. It doesn't magic out of nowhere. No. And and that is a real driven side of yep. of what uh, we're able to view and we're able yep. to see. It, it's it's not a mistake. It's it's yeah. it's done on purpose. It's not uh, it's not just you know airy fairy yep. kind of things. These are things that are really sought out and they're by very smart people yep. who know how to direct their information and yep. when to do it. And, and the volume that they need to do it yeah. at as well. And if it costs a million dollars, it costs a million dollars. They're not stupid. They're yeah. going to get it back. There's not an issue with that. Yeah. It is something that um, I, I, I think that modern uh, communication and, and modern kind of social media is able to combat slightly. Mm. Um, but it, it does mean that people have to readdress the way that they go about business. And, and one of the things that I think that small business does struggle with is is telling people about themselves yeah making sure that you know i i I talked to a guy jordan uh earlier this week actually um and and he's got a custom handmade guitar shop on hindley street wow a custom handmade guitar shop on hindley street now who the fuck would have ever thought of that never i love music i would never have thought of that before and it's just through a friend of a friend who went hey man you should interview my mate and having a chat with him and the way that he kind of came about his business and the way that he kind of come up and, and found that space was very, very coincidental. And he works his ass off. Mm. He works mm. 60, 70 plus hours mm. a week to make sure that he can survive, mm-hmm. that he can make these guitars, that he can repair mm. people's guitars and that he's available to people. Mm. And never heard of it. Never heard Amazing. of it. Never knew it was there. Young guy, I think he's twenty six years yep. old. So how do you, how do you combat that against people that are and and look, music industry in, in South Australia is probably a big one. We don't have a music industry here anymore. We don't have, uh, you know, we've had two massive music shops shut down. Mm. Um, there there isn't there isn't that retail industry that we can be so uh, accessible to because it's just as easy to jump online, yeah. skippity skip, and and you get what you want. But yep. when you're in trouble. Well, you, you can't plug in the USB and download it and yeah. make something happen and fix. And this is the problem where I think a lot of us as individuals, have, we, we're quick to blame governments for, yeah. for some sort of failure. But, I love blaming the government. Yeah, but we, Don't we, get we, me wrong. We need to actually look at our own behaviours. And I've got to yeah. say, I've never, I've, I've got a lot of vinyl. I've got a big vinyl collection. Yeah. I've never bought any vinyl online. Yeah. I'll always go in and support a record shop. That's part of the experience, exactly. though, isn't it? And, and it's the same with bookshops. You, you yep. want to go in and thumb through it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we can't sit there and 
blame the government for this and blame the government for that if we're actually engaging in behaviours that are detrimental to our society. And once we yeah. lose our record stores, once we lose our uh, news agents, once we lose our bookstores, we've lost those places that people go for conversation. They go for yeah. expert knowledge and yep. you know there's nothing better than going to a record shop with no idea what you're going to get and walking out with three albums you never you haven't heard of and yep. you go that is some of the best music i've ever listened to absolutely and, and the more that we've got a society that are relying on uh, advertising dollars and the more that those dollars kind of conglomerate into like these big kind of you know westfields or bloody you know whoever it is then the less opportunity we have to see those little little uh, little treasures yep. that kind of come through and leak through and I guess uh, I, I've seen a couple of things from, from yourself online and I think it was a bit of vinyl that uh, that you had posted a while ago that was like I think it's Green Day Dookie album yeah, yeah. and um, Love it. Uh, what else you had you had quite an eclectic mix yep. that was on there so what what kind of what as as Leon separate to the politician yep. what, what kind of things when you get home and you get to kind of take off all the uh, the the you know member of parliament jacket the member for for mawson jacket and all that yeah. stuff and you just get to sit there and have a beer and be yourself mm. what, what kind of things you jam into pretty much everything it's um when i grew up my first couple of albums were split ends my sex uh billy joel's glass houses album which i reckon is his best and uh he went a bit not so good after that <laughs> it was good live though he was very good live i saw him um live but um you know, again, it gets back to the... I was with the uh, Snap, Crackle and Pop guys the other day and I yeah. just sort of said, give me an album that I haven't got. So, yeah, Weezer. I took it home, oh, took it home Friday night. Brilliant. The Blue album. Yeah. And I never had that. I missed it. I think it came out in 94. Might have been around then when I was in Switzerland. And, of course, I was all on CD like most people back then. Yeah. And so I kind of... I've got the, the two missing years of my life. Um <laughs> You know, 94 to 96 when I was over there. Oh, man. Um, because... They were good years. Yeah, they were. Well, <laughs> Kurt Cobain died in 94, yeah, just after yeah. I arrived in, uh, in, uh, in, in Switzerland. So, But they were really good years, and there was some great, great music around. Um, yeah, Neil Young. Yep. Yeah. Some, play some of that. Some Yeah, it, it, it just depends. We... Uh, we just put a whole lot of stuff on. We we were listening to Powderfinger on Friday night because it's the 20th anniversary and we'd been around at yep. the King's Head and... Um, yeah, they were sort of playing the whole. I just saw that album. Pearl Jam's um, ten, Pearl Jam ten albums, twenty five years old. Wow. Like, what the hell? The industrial what, how the twenty. Hell did this get this old? Well, the industrial <laughs> sound was twenty years old last yeah, Friday. Yeah, right. Man. Yeah. So, and, and this double album um, that they've put out has got you know the uh, the Triple J from that day when they went on and sort of were playing tracks and everything else. Yep. So there's all these recordings that aren't on the original album. So. Um, you know, as Molly would say, do yourself a favour, get out and, uh, <laughs> and get it. But again, and look, we talk about the King's Head and the Sturt Street Sellers and yep. what they've done around there where they only sell South Australian food and South Australian yep. blues is just amazing. And that gets us back to we've got to support these people who were supporting, you know, cool winemakers, cool gin yeah. makers, cool yeah. brewers. And, um, you know, I just sort of think that... Uh, what uh, what they've done at uh, at the King's Head is something that's fantastic for South Australia, and, and we should support it. It's ten years this uh, next month since um, uh, since they kicked off their uh, their South Australian campaign. Yeah, right. So so and and I I don't know this intimately. So they're only using South South Australian produce and it's seasonal produce and things like yep. that. Or yeah, so you walk in and uh, they've got a whole cellar there. Yeah, mm -hmm. like so a beer fridge full of South Australian beer, yep. a, a wine fridge full of South Australian wine, and then racks of South Australian red wine. And then they've got all the gins and uh, all the spirits. And then they have people um, like Brendan Carter from Gumma Racker, who's just a genius. He's We're lucky to have him here. He and his wife um, just make amazing wines. And, and they've got this cooperative sense to what they do as well. Mm -hmm. So they, um, they work with the local grape growers and the local... Uh, um, people who've got orchards up there so there's a glut of apples they go give them here we'll make it into something and then you all take a, ch a, a, a commission out of yep. it lemons there was a big glut of lemons they made lemon cello and everyone instead of dropping their fruit on the ground put it into something productive and all the farmers got paid for it so yeah that's brilliant uh, brendan is uh, is brilliant he makes uh, some some really really good drinks he's and he's taken the botanics and he was the one who taught me that i think it's about 85 percent of the botanics in Australia are bitter. 
So they lend themselves to making drinks that are like the Camparis and um, and those drinks that the Italians have been doing for years. So yep. you can get these drinks from him and from other distillers around the place, and you can actually taste Australia in there. Yep. Kangaroo Island Spirits is doing amazing, uh, an amazing job as well. You know they've they've picked up best gin in the world. Um, their old Tom, yeah, right. yeah, their old Tom gin is just magnificent, and they're using stuff that we've weed on and walked on. <laughs> ever since we got here us, us white fellas <laughs> yeah. but the aboriginal people were using them as bush medicine yep. as as yep. food as nourishment yeah, I, I think for that, years yeah we have we have glossed over um our our indigenous heritage and yeah. the way that the indigenous people farmed our land yeah. the way that they uh sufficed for for nutrition from our land yeah. the way that they um the way that they went about so many different things and, and a friend of mine is very very passionate i mean he's, he's a council worker he's mm. going out and he's mowing your parks he's doing mm. all these things but when he goes out every single day and he, his instagram is just filled with finding these little treasures and yeah. it's great he goes look you see this this is actually an alternative to this yeah. you can use this as this and and his parents have got some some land out near murray bridge and he's got his plot kind of out there that he's um he's just done a, a bunch of back burning and, and whatnot on so he can regenerate seeds so we can do this do that it's an amazing thing yeah. i said to him mate you should come on here and i'd love to hear yeah. more about this stuff it's yeah. it's it's we've ignored this, this side of our heritage and he said oh i can't i'm not an expert and i said it doesn't fucking matter exactly <laughs> you don't have to be an expert yeah. what you have to be is passionate exactly and you're definitely that and you look at people like jocks on frillo who's got arana restaurant it's just been named best restaurant in australia in a another competition you know respected competition so the good food guide which is the sydney morning herald and the age yep. um and then earlier this year was gourmet traveler first time in over 20 years a restaurant outside of melbourne or sydney's got that gone yeah, right. and He's sort of up on the lands all the time and you know, he comes back and does some amazing things, but he's not on his own. Yep. There are other people doing it, but, but isn't it great that South Australia is now, you know, we used to be known as the wine state, but now we're the, the drink state yep. and the food state. And it's, yep. it's really good that we're getting that recognition. And what it's happened people, to us being the festival state? Well, we're still the festival state. And I mean, sometimes you actually get it all mixed into one with Tasting Australia. Yeah, you yeah, get a true, festival true. And you get the yeah, food and the drinks. That's but, a good time. But I think we should celebrate those people who call South Australia home and yeah. those people who have come here from other places. You know, Jock is from uh, uh, from Scotland. We've got uh, Africola. Uh, we've got yeah. all these great places. Um, I, I was talking before about uh, uh, Brendan up at Gummaraka. He came from Queensland. Uh, we've got Gareth who's got the King's Head. He's a South Australian. Yeah. But, you know, we should celebrate the fact that we have something about this place has attracted those people here yeah. um, and in many cases then kept people here. And I think one thing that we, we probably should touch on too as, as a legacy of our government that didn't cost us any money at all was changing those regulations to allow small bars to pop up around Adelaide. Yeah, I and think that has brilliant. been an absolute game changer. Yeah. And John Rao, who was Attorney General, um, you know, I call him the Prince of Peel Street, the Lord of Lee Street. <laughs> um, I think he's, yeah, I, I went to one one night. That's a fucking good title, Prince yeah, yeah, of yeah, Peel yeah. Street. Yeah, yeah, and I went, to, I went to one one night, Bad Dog Bar, you know, the one where you walk down that little side street uh, and there's a little light out the front. And, and I love taking people down there and I just get at the back and they keep walking and you slip in this door, but there's no sign. Anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and then they'll go, where are you going? And then they text me, oh, I'm at the bar. And they go, where's the bar? And they're walking up and down, they can't find it. So anyway, I sent a photo. I said, have you been to this one? He goes, where is it? I said, I can't tell you, it's a secret. There's a light on out the front, go down all the things. But you know, they're the sort of things that you've got to listen to people and then yeah. change the rules. If the, if the rules allow the big bully hotels to take it in turns at taking little guys to court and costing them 30, 40, 50 grand yep. in legal fees before they get to open their doors and put a bottle on the shelf or in the fridge, yeah. then that's unfair. And I think the just- Not only is it unfair, I don't think that that's what South Australians want. No, no. We don't want that. We and don't to, want the big boy fucking yeah. bully mentality. We, yeah. We're battlers. Yeah. We are, we're, uh, you know, I, uh, my background's been in, in motorcycles and, and I've, I've met some of the most brilliant minds and engineers that you could ever possibly meet yeah. and you would never pick it. Yes. Because they are humble. Yep. They are, um, they're not outspoken yep. and they let their work speak for itself. Yep. And, the, yep. and, and, you know, one guy from Manham um, comes to mind very easily, Jerry, and, and he, he builds some of the most, uh, he builds replica Grand Prix bikes from the 1960s. And they are sought after all over the world. He he sits there, he tinkers on every little bloody thing, and he's just this weird old guy. He speaks odd. His mates odd. They're all fucking odd. Mm. 
And I said to him one day, I said, what the fuck are you doing with that, Jerry? And it looked like he was walking in with a bloody ice cream. And he goes, well, this is, this is a piston. And it looked like this big ice cream. And I said, what the fuck, the weird bloke. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, he, he, he rocked up and he, he goes, come out the car park, young fella, and I'll show you something. And I went in there and there's this, like a proper Grand Prix bike. There's this old 1960s Grand Prix bike, Grand Prix bike in the back of his, um, his van. And... I said, fucking hell, Jerry, is this what you build? And he goes, every single bit of it, oh, except for that nut. One wow. nut. Everything else the bloke built by hand, by himself, yeah. up in Manham, doing yeah. his own thing. We love that stuff. Yeah. We, are, we are such a, um, uh, res- a resilient and uh, inventive yep. type. Yep. And we just need to, we need to celebrate that more. We, I'd love to be able to see, you know, people like Jordan get some money out of the government yeah. and be able to to have some security behind yeah. himself. So like he said, he goes, man, I just want to make guitars. Yeah. All I want to do is make yeah. guitars because that's my passion. That's what I love. But to do that, I have to I have to repair guitars. I have to make sure I'm open all hours of the day. I have to fucking work whatever in yep. many hours a week. They're the guys that need that little bit of a little yeah. bit of a hand up and a, and and a handout i guess but um they, it's well it's not a handout when they're when they're making it happen yeah. and, and and we we need to continue that yeah. that side of south australia it's disappointing that we don't build cars anymore yeah. but it's also disappointing we don't build washing machines anymore and we don't build hills hoists anymore and we don't have these things so yeah. i don't think it's a surprise yeah. um i don't think that the holdens shutting down and things like that should be a massive surprise to people we look at um, you know examples out of Detroit or out of Birmingham and out out of out of huge industrial uh, cities. Yep. They've stopped producing. Mm. They've had to change. Mm. Now some of them didn't do very well, and Detroit sticks out in my mind very easily. Mm. That they, they didn't come to the to the game and go right. We need to adjust mm. what we're doing now because Southeast Asia is really killing us, and yep. the Chinese is killing us. We need to have that foresight. Do you do you think that we're we're able to get around that to change that are we going to be looking at uh, renewable energy is brilliant yeah i i think we have and i think if you look at the the low unemployment figures that came out today that didn't happen because of something that was done last week or last month yeah that did that was we've got low unemployment figures because of things that we discussed in cabinet three or four years ago and yep. once we knew that holden was closing um every cabinet meeting started with a look at the jobs figures and not just where they're at now but there was like a year to two year sort of thing of the projects that we knew were coming online we had the big cliff fall off here where holden was going to go we had a few other things that we knew were going to disappear um and then the jobs come into the market and the focus through jay at every cabinet meeting started with what are we going to do about jobs and i think yeah. if you look at if we if we reflect back to when um holden's announced they were pulling out of south australia everyone was pretty down and it was yeah, pretty gloomy yeah. and stuff like that. And it takes leadership to sort of work out um, what are we going to do and bring everyone with you. And so we would we would constantly talk about that in Cabinet. And I know the Auditor General came out this week, and again, not to be critical of the Auditor General, but he's taken a look at it and he's sort of saying, oh, these schemes that we came up with, you know, to, to boost other areas, yep. that, that, that they're a bit sloppy maybe, I think was his language or something like that. But again, it's it's almost like an emergency. You're dealing with an emergency. Yep. And, and that's not to condone misuse of taxpayers' money or anything like that. But sometimes when you dealt with a disaster, whether it's a bushfire or, you know, a massive employer in one part of the state closing down, you know, Wyala, we nearly lost Wyala. Yeah. Gee, we put some work in up there as well, you know. Yeah. And, and have a look at it now, the, the difference, you know, and, and that a, was a really scary time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Port, yeah. Port, Port Perry. Imagine if we'd lost, yeah. you know, yeah. Wyala, Port, our third biggest right. city, Port Perry, you know. That, and these things were, through that transition, were really worrying to us. At yep. the same time, we had Holden. So I, I sort of think that, uh, you know, today's unemployment figures are a bit of a, a, a tick. And it's not to say that we don't all need to be doing more. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure the new government... Yeah, you don't stop work. No, no, no. I'm <laughs> sure the new government's, you know, working on ways as well. But, uh, gee, I think governments do have a role to be there working side by side with those small and medium sized businesses and then sector wide things as well because you know if we look at small and medium sized businesses they're the biggest employer you know we can talk about yeah. bhp and we can talk about holdings when they were here they are big employers but nowhere near what you know the I thought the, that the government was actually south australia's biggest employer uh, well, as a sector, it'd be small and medium-sized business, you right, know, right? When you when you tally yep. it all up, and 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 that's where the wealth comes from, and that's why we mm. need to look after those guys. And it's interesting, you know, the the difference um, in the new government. They 
they've been critical of us of giving out grants to businesses to help them you know flourish and yep. so so the cube at Darrenburg, uh, which is yeah. in, in my neck of the woods in mclaren vale um one of the to be honest with you when i first saw that thing i thought what the fuck are we yeah. giving that bloke money for yeah. what an idiot and now it's kind of done and it's a big thing so the osborne, <laughs> so. osborne family so Darry, he's 91 chester who's uh yeah my age about 50 he's um they've invested 13 million we put in 2 million but that wasn't a wow. check that wasn't a check to well it was a check to the osborne yep. family but that was that'll just pay the wages for the first year of those 80 extra people that they have to put on there. Yeah, that's right. And I can say, you know, I saw Darry over the weekend, you see they're getting up to 1,400 people a day through there. And wow. all the other cellar doors around the place are seeing a massive uplift. It's a knock-on effect. The restaurants yeah, and yeah. everything else. Um, there's there's people... Wanting, it's become a destination. Yeah, and people are building hotels there now yep. off the back of it. So, you know, people can sort of look at it and say, why give one uh, family $2 million? Well, we, we didn't. We gave it to a region. We gave it to an industry. Yeah. And we, we're seeing the benefits. And, and and also, I think you gave it to the bloke who's probably got a bloody good idea. He's yeah. got his hand out. Yeah. And he's put his hand up as well. Yeah. And he said, hey, guys, this, 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 this. I yeah. mean, I, I've gone through some um, uh, experiences with the government and, and writing grants and having applications and having meetings and all the bullshit yeah. that goes behind that stuff. And, and I can honestly say that, that it's, a, it's a really thorough... Mm-hmm. process yeah it isn't a, a matter yeah. of going hey man i've got an idea yeah. i'm going to spit out 200 words and you're going to yeah. give me bloody 20 grand or something so, like that it's it's not that like so darenberg has to employ i think it's 72 extra people yep. or they have to give pro rata some of that money back but what yep. we, we we looked at this and sort of said this is it's not going to be mona because it's not as big as mona yep um, down in Hobart, I think 40% of people who go to Tasmania visit Mona while they're there. I mean, the built form is as important in many cases as what it is they're going to drink and what they're going to eat and the beautiful landscapes they're going to see. It, it, yeah. it's, it just adds to the dish, if it's, you like. Yeah, it complements. You know? so, so the new government see this as a virtue not to, what they say, play favourites yeah. and not to help. So I don't know... Uh, I don't know this what's going to happen there. This is a strange thing. I mean, and because it's it's really nice to say like we're not going to play favourites. Yeah. What the fuck are you going to play? Yeah. Because there's a reason. Why Actually, the word favorites. is not play favourites. They say we're not going to pick winners. That's their phrase. Well, that's even stupid. Yeah, yeah. We're, that, so their phrase is we're not going to pick winners. So we're going to pick losers. <laughs> don't go down the track with those guys. <laughs> yeah. So I reckon you got to pick winners you sometimes. Yeah, you have to. And, and, and you'll and, get someone who grizzles. And you'll go. Well, did you fill in the forms? Did you put your hand up? Did yep. you ha- did you have a vision to? I don't reckon there's too many South Australians who had the wacky vision that Chester Osborne had nope. to build something that looks like a Rubik's cube, or slightly <laughs> other thing. Like hands up, 1.7 million people yeah. in South Australia. Who else had that idea? Yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing. I mean, and and that's that's the beauty of vision and foresight, and somebody who is uh, eloquent enough to put that forward, yeah. and. Um, uh, tenacious enough to to, to to keep going after it and I'm sure it wasn't just a matter of him going into a meeting going hey man I reckon this and I'm going to build this Rubik's Cube mm-hmm. and it's going to be fantastic and I want that much and then got an email and said oh mate you've got it mm. there's a hell of a lot more that Absolutely. goes into it and and sometimes it um, I mean, like I said look everyone loves having a go at the government because mm. fuck man we all love having a go at someone you got to the government is so easy to have a go at it's there it's whoever it's a faceless entity and we can all be angry at them but sometimes and not all the time but sometimes a lot of the time uh these things happen in our best interest yep. they happen in our best interest there isn't the boogeyman standing behind everything rubbing their hands together and and going ha 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 got one over everybody and i'm secretly going to get mm-hmm. a check out the back door that is such a rare occurrence and i guess it would have happened at some stage somewhere but it's such a rare occurrence that there isn't the um, there isn't the point that we should be taking that as the uh, the, the priority and out the back of our minds. Mm. How did this guy get money? Ooh, he did the work. Yeah, exactly. He did the work. He yeah. had the idea. He's got the passion. He's got the ability. If we help, yeah, and that's what I think government is there to do. Yeah. Government is there to not only govern us and to punish us if we do the wrong mm. things and all the the obvious stuff, but they're there to assist people and. One thing that I've learned in the last probably two years is that government don't want people to fail. Mm-mm. That's silly. Why? Why would? Why would somebody uh, make grant applications so difficult? Well, it's because it needs to be vetted properly, yeah. and we need to have solid foundations into what we're going to going to uh, uh, put our money into. 
Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. That's a brilliant thing. It's not that people want you to fail. Yeah. And it's so easy to turn around and go, oh, man, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, if yeah. this, if that. They're all what-ifs. Yeah. They're, they're also your didn'ts. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a, and also, a grey area. You can sit back and never approve anything. And nothing ever happens. Yeah. Or you can improve. You can approve a thousand things, and fifty of them don't work out. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's the other a, reality. It's not a bad strike rate, is it, mate? That, I'd rather. That's exactly. Right. I'd rather say, let's just get on and and do things. And, and as a minister, lots of decisions come across your desk. Yep. And there's some who, over the years of all political persuasions, have been paralysed yep. about making a choice. Now that's that's the worst thing. That's the biggest mistake you can ever make. Not, yeah. not being wrong isn't the biggest mistake. Not doing anything on any of them yeah. is the bigger mistake. That's exactly right. Inaction. Yeah. Inaction is, is yeah. just a terrible thing because it means you're stagnant. And yeah. being stagnant, you get the mozzies, yeah. you get all yeah. the shit hanging and I hope, around. I hope the new, stinks. You and know, I hope the new stuff. government, you know, and, and as I said, I get on pretty well with most of them, you know, yep. um, as you should because, you know, we're all in there trying to do the best we can. But uh, I think a few of them have been a little cautious because yep. they've been in opposition for 16 years. So yeah. all of a sudden you get in the car and a Apart from Rob Lucas, there's no one who's been there before as a minister. Yep. So you can't just sort of, at, at least what we had over 16 years was everyone who came into the ministry, we'd usually do it two at a time. Yep. They had another 12 or 13 people that they could bounce ideas off or get some wisdom from. Yep. Um, it's pretty hard when you're all sort of, you're, all uh, you're a startup, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Rob Lucas scares me. Mm. He scares me. Mm. He, um, I, I have a, a bad taste in my mouth from the last time that he sold all our shit, and mm. now it looks like he's doing it again. Mm. A- am I right to be scared? I don't know. Oh, look, <laughs> that's a pretty know, forward uh, question. But. Yeah, I know. But if I sit here and sort of have a crack at Rob Lucas, then I just look like a bloke who's a politician yeah, yeah. bag in the other yeah, bloke. True, and I true. kind of want to be a bit constructive. Yeah. But so, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed for the portfolio areas that I had yep. that the cuts have taken place, particularly around female sports facilities. You know, they've, yep. they've ripped $24 million out that we had in there. And you know, there's all these women who are out playing sport for the first time in many cases. Yeah. And you've got girls and women who are changing in their cars, changing behind bushes, changing, in, changing in men's toilets with urinals mm-hmm. um, that should have their own facilities. And yep. you can't do it overnight, but we sort of put together a program to roll out $24 million and then we're going to put more money into it when that run out. And they've just cut that. Yeah. You know, and I just sort of, uh, really, you know? Feel a bit uneasy about it. Well, I just sort of think we need our, we need people to be fit. We need people to be engaged in sport because sport is so much more than just kicking a footy around. Yeah. It's, great for people of all ages whether they're the people out playing lawn bowls who have retired because then they've got connectivity they're they're hanging out together it's great for kids who learn about losing which is even more important than learning about winning absolutely and absolutely you know and i think with the the people sometimes demire uh, lament the demise of school sport i actually think it's not a bad thing because you have your school community yeah and then if you kids want to play sport and we brought the 50 dollar uh, voucher in so yep. that primary school kids get fifty dollars off their club membership and uh, uh, well done to the Liberal Party they've put that up to a hundred dollars now and I think that's okay. really important so that helps break down a barrier for joining a sports club but if you've got kids and they're at the local primary school um, and they're ones at the local netball club and ones at the local footy club then that is just another layer of connectivity yeah. and community yeah, working together absolutely. so I just sort of think picking on grassroots sport cutting funding out of there it's it costs you a lot more. It costs you money. It, it will cost you more money in your justice system and all oh, sorts of the, the, ways the ongoing the track. effect to having health. Uh, yeah, well, to, yeah. To health and well being yeah. coming out of a sporting background. Sport teaches you so much, and like you said, I think one of the most important things is learning how to lose. Yes. Learning how to lose is one of the most important things in life yeah. because you are not guaranteed to win. Yeah. In fact, you're more guaranteed to lose than you well, are to When you're to unco win. like me, you're guaranteed. You, you, what you do, I reckon, is you learn not to be that idiot who throws golf clubs or smashes rackets yeah. and stuff like that. You learn to just laugh at yourself and your yeah. own um, lack of ability. And be happy with... And, and have, enjoy your yeah. life. Have a smile, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I am... Literally the world's worst golfer, and I played golf in the pro am with uh, Lydia Ko, who was then the world's number one women's. Oh, golf really? Player. Yeah, eighteen-year-old. She would have been spewing. 
she was uh, I was I've never been more nervous I was like yeah. literally I can get up and speak in front of thousands of people I can get up in parliament you know all that sort of stuff not a hint of nerves you know plenty of confidence and uh, I said to my son who was like 16 at the time uh, I said mate I've got to play in the Pro-Am we're out playing golf we play once or twice a year down at Wollonga yep. and uh, I said oh, I'm going to play in the Pro-Am he goes dad you don't you do can't it play. mate you'll be embarrassed <laughs> and anyway he um, I said, oh, look, they're just going to put me down the back with someone. And then the draw came out and they put me with Lydia Ko and the sponsor and the head of Golf Australia. Oh, man. And he's just going, you've got to pull out. I said, okay, well, you can't pull out now. No. You can't go back in your words. So I've never been more nervous. He was my caddy. And I lined up. Lydia had her shot, beautiful shot. Just, it was just a little bit off the fairway. And then the head of Golf Australia, big man, big man. He went past Lydia's shot. And... Uh, the sponsor did really well, and then I got up there, and I was shaking. And I'm right-handed at everything except golf, because Dad was left-handed at golf, and I didn't want to. So you just kind of learnt that so way. I just and, and you know, I, I went to a pro once, and I said, I think maybe I'm right-handed. He goes, gives a look left-handed. So I showed him, and he goes, Okay, use my right-handed. He goes, Shit, you're really bad at both, mate. But <laughs> might as well stick with the left because you bought your clubs. Anyway, so I, I went back, and I literally got to here, and I thought I was going to vomit. Yeah. And, and and Connor, words were ringing in my ear. He goes, Don't do for the the big backswing he goes because too much shit goes wrong between there and there so just go to there so i just went to there and just brought it through and somehow some miracle from god i timed it beautifully and i landed just short of lydia's ball but i was in the middle of the fairway and the whole because it was tv cameras yeah know? yeah and, and i said to him i said look that is the second most dangerous place to have your camera and they go where's the worst place i said just there i've got this like really bad slice Anyway, so I turned to Connor after I did it, and, and, and there was this gallery and there was cameras and everyone was applauding and they yeah, go, yeah. great shot, Liam. And uh, I went over to Connor and go, did you get that? Because I gave him my phone to video. Yep. He goes, I don't know, I had my eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's my sporting ability. But I love sport. I was a sports journalist. So on, on sport, and, and one of the things, and my mates will fucking kill me if I don't bring this up with a, uh, with a parliamentarian like yourself. On sport, I mean, we've, we've seen the growth of um, alternative sport in Australia. Mm. In the world, we've seen the growth of alternative sports over the last kind of 20 years or so. But it does feel like um, Adelaide in particular is uh, either shy of being able to invest in this or, or, or we're quite backwards in the investment in this. And, and Adelaide is the only capital city in the Southern Hemisphere that doesn't have a skate park. How, how can we be a international cycling hub? How can we hold one of the greatest races that happen every yep. year yep. in Adelaide and then we neglect what has just become an Olympic sport in, mm. in BMX riding, what has just become an Olympic sport in skateboarding? Mm. And we have, um, and, and like you said before that, that, that you brought up that uh, women's change change mm. rooms and, and women's facilities within grassroots sport is, is almost non-existent unless you're playing netball. Our, our facilities in, in Adelaide and in our CBD, there aren't toilets. Mm. There is one little bubbler tap mm -hmm. and it is, it is a temporary skate park mm. that is popped off in the parklands out yeah. of the way. And, and, you know, when we do have Mad March and we've got the clips and we've got things, they're not accessible. Yeah. We couple that with what we look at uh, with youth crime yep. or, or the bored youth and why are they doing this? Why is there graffiti? Why is there this? Why is there that? But then we don't recognise, or we might recognise, but we don't, uh, we don't uh, apply ourselves to change or build this facility. I know that the Labor, um, the Labor government had come up with a scheme to, to put a skate park on the outskirts of the CBD mm. near Adelaide High School. That was five years after the, uh, the old skate park was mm. ripped down. And it seemed to be something that was more of a... Um, uh, more of something that was probably an afterthought yeah. in a campaign than what was actually needed yeah. in our in our uh, in the heart of our CBD. There are there are businesses that revolve around these things. Mm. There are I can think off the top of my head three or four businesses that absolutely revolve mm. around those facilities within our CBD um, and youth services. Lots of youth services utilised throughout our, our suburbs and yep. our metropolitan area, skate parks and those facilities to be able to bring people in and to be able to engage with people mm. that are uh, predominantly the hardest group of people to engage with yep. is is that you know that sixteen to twenty five year olds and, and whatnot and, and and then we look at 
we're the festival state, we're the party state. Yeah. We've got Mad March, we've got the Fringe, we've yeah. got the Adelaide Festival, we've got you know the the tasting bloody mm. tasting Australia. Tasting Australia, yeah. We've got those things yet we're absolutely and it feels like we absolutely ignore this 16 to 25 year old alternative yeah. sports and giving them a place it's I, I i was so pissed off that we spent one hundred and eighty thousand dollars putting a fake beach on the torrens and that that we you know we've got glenelg yeah it's a I know. real beach yeah maybe if you're in it's, paris you put a fake beach in the center of paris but yeah i'm with you like what was that all about and no one went to it because no we're not idiots it. no um you know, and, and come it was down out of the way as well yeah. if you look at our cbd and, and we are adelaide we yeah. are we are a small we're a kilometer yeah. square that's what that's what we got and we use it really well yeah but there's two things putting that beach there is yeah. ridiculous yeah We've got a beach volleyball set up in the heart of our CBD. Yep. And it seems superfluous. Yeah. It doesn't seem well, like a... So if we look at that lack of skating facilities, that's probably a failing that I had. But um, there was no one really that I remember coming to us with a concise, well-thought-out plan. And you know what the easiest thing to fix is someone who comes to you with a problem but a solution. Absolutely. And you know, BMX came to us and they wanted a world-class BMX track. So we yep. put in, I think, 1.5. I think the, the, the Marion Council and Onkaprinka Council and a great sign of two councils working together, I think put in 750 each. So we've got the money there to build a Sam Willoughby International BMX yep. track and another one out near the velodrome, a world-class one, and a wind tunnel near the velodrome so that they can do all the testing on helmets and things yep. like this and possibly, because uh, there's no other wind tunnels in South Australia, that the defence industries and aerospace industries can use that as well. So we did put an extra $11 million into you know, the cycling thing, but I think what we probably need to do is engage with those people who are, are as you said, hard to engage with, that demographic in that sort of 16 to 21 year group, and let's just all get around the table. And yeah. we actually need to, is, should it be in the CBD? You know, I know the Adelaide City Council were sort of taking some responsibility in getting something up. And I think they were working with John Rao, who was Minister for Planning. So I knew, I could sort of hear the noise that there was something happening yeah. with the skate uh, park venue to take over from what's now where, you know, there's university buildings on down yeah, on yeah. North Terrace and Samri. So, um yeah, that was a failing of ours, you know, it, and it's something that we it, it's should something get together. that um, you know, I I I guess I, I re-energized or I'm, I might have had an early midlife crisis. I reckon, yeah. no, it's something like that. Anyway, I snapped my arm in half, <laughs> getting on a BMX for the first time ever, and and um, when I did get back, I you know, I as a young guy, I loved skateboarding and whatnot, yeah. and was always hanging out at skate parks, and that's that's all we did. We that's yeah. how we kept out of trouble. There was probably you know, four or five mates and, and we just mm. stuck together like glue and, and we just skated all the time. And uh, from that, I, I grew into motorcycles and, and through that passion of motorcycles became a, a 13 year career. Yeah. Um, and 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 when that kind of went to the wayside and, and probably just before it went to the wayside, it, it um, I, I, I discovered a passion for riding bikes and, and well, trying to ride bikes yeah. and, um, and started hanging out at some skate parks. And I, I, I couldn't believe the facilities that we didn't have mm. in, in the CBD. Mm. And then some of the facilities, like out at Manapara, absolutely brilliant. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. It's integrated into the community. Uh, it's right next to the community library. It's with parks. It's with barbecues. It's, it's something that is just a classic way to be able to make mm. something work and, and be used. And the fact that we didn't have it within the CBD was surprising. Yeah. I then started to get quite interested in it. Uh, looking at Melbourne and 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 uh, some documents that came out of the Melbourne City Council that that was all about integrating these facilities into artwork, mm -hmm. into public facilities mm. that are already there, and it's, you know it's a shared facilities kind of thing, bringing costs down and yep. not putting immediate costs in saying because if you go to the general public and say hey I'm going to spend five million dollars on a skate park yep. they are not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. If you go to them and say hey I'm going to spend five million dollars in upgrading a bunch of facilities and. And particularly one meeting that I went to, uh, which was the, uh, was it the Market to River uh, precinct coming mm -hmm. from Topham Mall down to the uh, down to the Torrens. Yes. Um, and great. And what they've done with that is fantastic. Yep. I love walking up and down there. And there's mm. some great restaurants. There's some great little nooks and crannies and whatnot. Yep. And and there's about thirty or forty of us at this meeting, and they were saying, look, we want to speak to 
um, young organisations. We want to speak to artists. We mm. want to speak to people about developing these areas. And it was probably the most disappointing meeting I've ever been to because really? people, people's suggestions that they wanted grassed areas for yoga. Mm-hmm. And I thought, but we've got parklands mm. and, and we've, we've got, got the, squares. We've got the banks of the River Torres. We've got all of those things. And how the hell are we going to integrate that into yeah. a city walkway? Yeah. This is weird. I was the only person who said that I'd like to see something that's able to be used for young people and yeah. be able to skateboard and, and ride bikes and yeah. things like that. And it was glossed over and off it went. Um, I did think the Adelaide City Council, where they redeveloped Victoria Square for the umpteenth time, did turn that into a massive uh, skate area. I mean, that's what it looked like, and it was pretty much deserted unless we filled it up as a state government with events. Yeah, yeah, and and that's I mean, that's a really good remark because that is probably the space that that young guys, especially skaters, yeah. utilise that area yeah. to be able to skateboard. And and I think the stigma behind uh, that age group and yeah. particularly around that kind of skating you know culture is that you little shits, you ruin all my stuff, mm-hmm. and I don't want to be around you. Victoria Square is kind of empty a lot of the time. It is, unfortunately, isn't it? it is. It is, uh, but and then it you does lo- get but utilised. Then you, but then you lose it for three to four weeks when you've got the tour down under yeah. on and things like that. So you've, you've, you, it that doesn't really work, does it? It can, no. it can be something on top. But I, I would say that people shouldn't underestimate the support that older generations have for skate parks. Because yeah. when I was door knocking in Kingscote, I knocked on this door and. Uh, this couple said, "Come in." And they were a retired couple, and they said, uh, "You know, I was I was a school teacher, but I retired 12 years ago. And the number one issue for the last 10 years that I was there was they wanted a new skate park because you should have seen this one they had. It was built in 1972, <laughs> and it, it wasn't. It didn't resemble a skate park. It was like asphalt, and it looked like the Sturt, a miniature version of the Sturt Creek. You know where they've got yeah, yeah. down at North, where they've got those sort of concrete things. Yeah. It looked like that. It was just a snake thing that went down. Yep, with a kind of thing and the thing, and this kid." <laughs> getting around in moon boots because they did nasty things so, so, so they'd been fundraising they already had 30 or 40 grand in the bank because there, yeah, right. there was kids at the school whose parents had been at the school when they started raising money for the skate park but the government and the local member at the time hadn't passed it on to the government that this was a need yeah. so I came back and I said to Jay you know this is a really big thing so we were over there for country cabinet and the woman who's the head of the uh, Kingscote Progress Association uh, Marie uh, she's sitting there and it would have been a big issue for them. So Jay gets up and he goes, Biggles has been door knocking. He reckons that you need a new skate park. So I've got 120,000. Well, Marie bursts into tears, you know? And I'm sitting next to Tom Cousantonis because Jay's up behind us and we're all at this big long table, all the ministers. So anyone in the audience can ask any questions they want. So Marie bursts into tears and I'm sitting next to Tom Cousantonis, who was treasurer at the time. And he goes, What's she crying for? And I go, she's happy, mate. Haven't you ever seen anyone happy? <laughs> um, but we then, and then so we did all the work. And then just the week before the election, yep. we had the opening of it. And there were as many older people, retired people there, yep. as there were young people. And everyone, it doesn't matter what your age demographic you were in, was really pleased to have that facility. And that was the thing that kind of surprised me a little bit because you're right. I think sometimes we think that there's this NIMBY thing that people don't want it in their backyard, that yeah. people will just as you said, it's going to be drugs, it's going to be graffiti. It's going to, yep. I reckon skate parks are probably one of the best self-regulated spaces oh, absolutely. you can find. Hands down, absolutely. People, people don't put up with dickheads. No. You no. know? It just doesn't happen. Yeah. It's it's one of those kind of unwritten rules of, of a skate park that you don't fuck around or you're yeah. going to ruin it for everyone. Yes. So if you want to be like that, piss off, go somewhere yeah. else. It's not going to happen on yeah. our turf. I, I remember, you know, we just got started riding again and I tell you, man, I was... Never owned a BMX in my life, and my yeah. mate got me to, you know, somehow fucking spend money on it and buy this BMX. So we're down at this skate park, and and this kid comes after me, and he goes, "Nice bike, mate. You reckon I can have a shot?" There you go. You're ten years old or something. Yeah. He jumps on this thing, and off he goes. He's bloody ten foot in the air doing three sixties, and this other kid jumps on and does a bloody backflip. And I'm like, "What the fuck are these kids doing these days? This is crazy." And, uh, and there's this little kid, and he's sitting down in the corner, and he starts wandering off, and he's in tears. He's bawling his eyes out. And, um, and another lad who was skating around, he was a little bit older, you know, he's probably 20-odd. And he said, you're right, mate. And he goes, no, nah, it's bloody kid. He keeps stealing my lunch at school. He's stealing my money. I had $5. And he's just, oh, man, so many fucking tears. Anyway, we see this kid who's been stealing his shit on the other side of the park. I'm like, oi, you 
come here and 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 he came over and goes i swear i swear i look i look i I happen to have five dollars and i'd be happy to give it back to this kid and gave it back to him and said mate if you fucking go near his shit Mm -hmm. again Mm -hmm. i'll tell you what so it you know we get to know a few of the kids around uh, and and whatnot and and that kid uh, lovely little little tiny tiny little kid he he kind of he was safe there yeah he was respected there. Yep. He didn't get teased there. He yep. didn't get anything. And he was the smallest little kind of fella yeah, yeah, yeah. that was in the whole spot. And it wasn't just us. as We were the old guys, obviously. Yeah. There was the middle-aged guys and then there was the young group. And everybody kind of gets the message yeah. pretty quickly that people bullying like that, it's not on. Yeah. And it's it's outside of the school kind of... Um, outside of the school structure. Yeah. It's not getting into that kind yeah. of work structure. There's that little in between that people kind of miss out on sometimes. Yeah. And a lot of kids, if if you're having trouble at home yeah. and you, you don't feel like that you can stay at home or, yeah. you know, mum or dad's kind of not right or yeah. uh, some things are going, you need a place to go. But a you need mentors. Kids, kids need mentors. They need role Absolutely. models, you know. Absolutely. And I just sort of think with, you know, families the way they are now, you know, are the parents absent with work or yep. absent because there's been a family breakup or whatever? It's you, you sort of need the people in your life that I guess we had when we were growing up. We're more from you know uncles and relatives yep. and yeah. friends of mum and dad and so those sort of people. Yeah, you know, big brothers or yeah. you know I had my my big brother or my neighbour. Yeah, and always if I was in a bit of trouble, they'd kind of oh you're, what are you doing? Yeah. Or if I was getting in trouble and it was my fault, give me a clip behind the ear and like, yeah. you're a dickhead, mate. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, it's 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 something that that still needs to happen yeah. we, st- we can't forget about this stuff and we we tend to i guess be complacent with some things yeah and and i think that's one of the things that, that uh, i think we've been complacent about that there's facilities out there that kids can use that or it yeah. doesn't matter they're bloody do everything on the streets anyway yeah. and they're causing a nuisance what are we going to spend this money on for exactly it, it's i think it's a good thing. idea I, so i think we should all get together and i can have a chat with uh, Corey wingard who's the new uh, Minister for Rec and Sport. Ah, the donut guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we need to <laughs> we need to get the council on side. If it's yeah, and if if it's the belief that it has to be in the CBD, then uh, that's where we'll you know put put the effort into with it. There'll be I, a new council after November. So yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's them. lots of things happening around at the moment, and yeah. I guess um, with uh, the unfortunate uh, passing away of uh, Quentin. Yep. Um, has has maybe brought a lot of a limelight into into you know um, facilities, I guess, for disabled people and whatnot. Yes. And the fact that he was running for uh, for Lord Mayor as well, and 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 I hope that um, by all means, I've I've met with um, Martin Hazy a couple of times, and and think that he was a, a, a fantastic Lord Mayor. Yeah. And uh, I'm fortunate to see him um, having to mm. step aside, but I hope that uh, we do get somebody that comes in and is as passionate with that yeah. kind of area and, and with development within the city as, as what they were. Yeah. But do, do you miss being in the thick of it, being the minister and having the, the loads of responsibility coming, coming down on you? There's not a second I wouldn't have back, but I, I've done it. Yep. And I've been there. And if I look through my life and career, um, I've put 120% into everything I've ever done. Yeah. And getting back to, you know, when you first get your first job, do the basic jobs really well and then you get to do the better jobs. Whatever it is that you're doing in life, whether it's in vocation or in your private life, put do the very best you can mm. and enjoy it. Gee, enjoy it, you know? Yeah. There's no point doing stuff if you're not going to have a laugh. It's addictive. And a smile. And, you know, you can be professional and have fun at the yep. same time. I think that's really important. So what what would you say, and, and just tying things up a little bit, what would you say as far as uh, young people wanting to get into a parliamentarian role or into politics yep. or into a, a, being a member of a party? I mean, yep. how, how do you see people coming into that kind of space? Well, it was funny because I didn't come through Young Labor. Obviously, 2001, I was probably, you know... 21 again. 35. I don't know. What, <laughs> 35, I think it would have been. Yeah. And so, um, just doing the quick maths, maybe 36. And um, so, I didn't come through young labour. I didn't come through university politics. And um, so, I don't know whether that's a good thing or not to do that, whether you want to um, commit yourself too early to yep. where you want to be or you want to live life. But, you know, probably a good idea to, if you've got a leaning one way or the other, to contact a major party. Um and have a chat with people or ring up your local MP and go and have a, have a chat with them. Because honestly, I, I reckon I've got a pretty good relationship with the young people in the in the area. Yep. We have a lot of laughs, you know, and uh, you've got to engage at the sort yeah. of level that they want. You've got to take the piss 
out of Absolutely. yourself. Absolutely. And out of them as well. You yeah. know, we've got this great bunch of young fellas down at, uh, and girls at Wollonga High. And I called in there, it was their sports day. I was driving past the day before the election. So I turn up there and they've got my core flutes and they're run, they've been running around, they put lipstick on them <laughs> and they've been running around all day at this, uh, at this sports day. And then they're going, bagels, bagels, bagels. And the principal's up there trying to present the prizes and there's this whole, you know, swathe of them who've just like, broken away from the official proceedings yep. and come running towards me going, we want to get selfies and stuff like that. So <laughs> what I want to do is we're stuck with an office that's not in my electorate at the moment. It's up at Hackham. And um, hopefully uh, Rob Lucas and his um, department will have us in there sometime within the next six months down at Aldinga. And I yep. said to these guys, I said, I want, to, I want to get you guys sitting around the table because it's really hard for us to engage meaningfully um, yeah. with with youth. So if we can get those Aldinga, Wollonga, McLaren Vale kids, my Ponga kids, sort of Yankalilla kids sitting around the table and actually go, what's important to you? What What is it that you want? Give them a voice. That's what they need. And they and they communicate in a, in a different way yeah. than what we used to. Having a 20-year-old son's great because yep. you get a real insight into it and stuff. So, um, so you can kind of brush ideas past him and he goes, oh, I say, Dag, not that again, you know. <laughs> oh, actually, you're onto something. I think there. I'm looser than he is. I think he's the guy running the show. You know, he's the, he's the brains. He's of the keeping op- you in check. He's the brains of the operation. <laughs> uh, look, he was my campaign manager too, and gee, we had really? fun. Really? Yeah, he was. That's he, look, awesome. He's been around politics since he was six years old. So my first campaign started in 2004 for the 2006 election, mm-hmm. and I'm driving around going, okay, let's. And he's, he's sitting there with a map, um, and he's six. And I said, we're going to go to Old Norlunga now. He goes, Old Norlunga's not in the electorate. I said, of course it is. Everything on the eastern side of South Road from Woodcroft down to McLaren Vale is in the electorate. He goes, Dad, it's not in the electorate. I said, yeah, it is. He goes, Dad, pull over. Pulled over. He shows me the map. He goes, see the line goes, and I go, you're right, mate. And uh, Pat, Pat, <laughs> From that moment on, you're just listening to him. <laughs> and Pat Conlon, who was, uh, who was my boss at the time because I was his chief of staff as, yep. uh, when he was infrastructure minister, he used to say to Connor, he goes, your dad's just keeping the seat warm for you, son. He goes, uh, you're the brains of the operation. So it's been a bit of a joke, but it is, it is great. You know, he's a he's a great fella, and um, you know, it's it's nice to do. And he and he's doing international studies and economics at Adelaide, and he's always been interested in politics, and he's doing yep. Chinese and stuff like that. So it's really good to see his insight and his view of the world. And um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I love hanging out with the the young crew. You know, they just you were, you were in a bit of trouble about your uh, your core flute signs and all of that stuff, having the uh, having yeah. the wrong colour or something. How like bizarre that, right? is that? How, how bizarre? You know that you're in a cha- in with a crazy chance of winning the unwinnable seat. When it comes seat, down to that, when the, on the Monday it was a public holiday, it was Adelaide Cup Day. That you had Nick Senefon and Stephen Marshall having a crack at me for using the colour blue on my posters. Now. That's just a point of difference. Yeah. And that's just in the last week of an election, you know, instead of just having my ugly head on the stovey poles, put a message up there. So I had, you know, standing up for my ponga, Leon Bignall MP. Leon lives here throughout McLaren Vale. Leon yeah. Bignall MP. And they were blue. And I'll tell you, it was as easy as I've still got the text exchange because Connor was sitting in, you know, in his bedroom probably and I was in the lounge. I don't know where. No, he was probably in the office. And, and he, he texts me through and he goes, I said, I just want them black and white just so they really stand out because, you know, there's so much noise on all the stoby poles and people yeah. are driving yeah. past. You want the message to be like that, short, sharp. And uh, I've used blue since 2004, since my first campaign. My business cards are blue. My office is blue. My letterhead's blue. Is there any reason blue. behind the colour or it's I, just... I, I hate red. My favourite colour is blue. <laughs> there you go. And that's a good enough reason. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I've never had any, any red stuff. And, um, you know, and blue's a soothing colour. And um, so... You know, it was as simple as, you know, you're, you're hectic, you're doing all these things, you're working 20, 21 hour days. And he goes, what about the blue and white? I go, yeah, do that. And yet Stephen Marshall and the Liberals and Nick Xenophon and his crew were trying to beat it up, some conspiracy that I was trying to cheat my way in. No one owns the colour blue. No. no one owns the colour red. It's use whatever colour you want. It's nice to have credit from being like some type of evil mastermind yeah, though. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> well, I was I've the, got them with this one. I was at the races. I had to prevent the, present the Adelaide Cup and I'd had a couple of sherbs, you know, during the day. Yep. And uh, I, I was a bit unaware that all this was happening. So I, I present the thing and then all the TV cameras there go, can we interview? I'm going, yeah. And they go, oh, you're being criticised for these, uh, these blue <laughs> posters. And I said, you know what? I've been using the colour blue since 2004 and I'm a true blue Labour bloke. <laughs> and they ran it. They all ran the grab. It was probably, you know, when you win by 115 votes, 
Who knows? All those little point one percent of and things. What was the what was the donut gate thing all about? The, uh, the... Donut. That was Corey because um, one of our other guys, Blair Boyer, who's a great young talent coming up through the yeah, party. Yeah. He's out in the northeastern suburbs, a seat of right. Um, he went to his local um, fire station on International Firefighters Day yeah. and took some uh, some some donuts. Yep. And then he gets his uh, do not take the donuts memo from. Yeah. Uh, from I read about this from the new, new emergency the... services minister. And I'm thinking, hang on, I've been in for 12 years and I've been calling in whenever I want yep. to say, you know, you don't get in the way, you don't go there when there's a fire no. or anything like that. But these people are volunteers who yep. not only go out when there's a car crash, not only go out when there's a fire. Mate, they see some horrific Absolutely. Things. But they're doing training every Tuesday night, Wednesday yep. night. They're turning up for the siren going off on a Sunday because yep. they, they do all that. So these people put enormous hours in. So the least we can do is, as representatives is call in from time to time. So I thought... Oh, I'll give give Corey a bit of stick. So I went to all the CFSs on a Tuesday night in the uh, electorate. Didn't do any media on it, but then one of them, uh, bless them, they put it on uh, Facebook or something yep. like that, and then um, it just sort of took off from there. So I did this. Uh, <laughs> don't shit stare. I said donuts. <laughs> I, I did hashtag donuts of defiance, and then. Um, the, the cartoonist at the Tizer did this thing oh, where they they, 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 they morphed me in with uh, Homer Simpson <laughs> yeah. and, and, and this donut. And I tell you, without giving too much away, you might see that post, that, that image yeah. on the Stobie Poles next Mate, election. you've got to use cause, it. Because you know what I want to have? Leon Bignall and with me being like Homer with a big donut and then just go, mmm, pee. <laughs> Hey, what do you reckon? Gold. It's all marketing. Absolute gold. It's all marketing. It's, marketing. it's actually gold. And they won't be blue. Who doesn't they'll... like a donut? Yeah. And, and they'll be pink. And Homer Simpson. And they'll be pink. Oh, well, you can't argue about they'll, that. they'll fit in with the whole Simpson thing. <laughs> well, Leon, look, thanks for coming through. And I do really appreciate your time. And I know that you've had a big day in Parliament. And now you're doing hey, this afterwards. I'll and... tell you what, this is the best part of a big day in Parliament is getting out of there. Yeah. Now, I've never, ever really enjoyed the bit about being in Parliament. I mean... I've never been in a portfolio where we've had to put through lots of legislation. Do you find yourself sometimes just having to sit there and doodle characters of other people in Parliament? or did, You've seen that, haven't you? Since <laughs> I, two, I did. That haven't. was back in 2006, my first estimates That's experience. hilarious. When I started doing sketches of those opposite. And, Were they uh, good sketches? No, they weren't bad. Look, I said at the time, I'm no Pablo Picasso, but yeah. um, when, whenever I was at school, I've always just done these doodles and they're all these faces. And... Uh, yeah, during estimates, you're stuck there for 10 hours of just mm. thing. But I've always drawn, and it helps me listen, you know, yeah. and it helps me concentrate. It doesn't yep. mean, you know, oh, I'm not all bloke. I can do two things at once, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. So um, it just helped me listen. So that, there was another thing where it was all over page five, and oh, look at this bloke, he's just drinking. Scan. That is hilarious. Yeah, I, just, I absolutely piss myself laughing. I could be... I, act, I recall that happening. Yeah. It was so many years ago, and, and I thought, right, I'm going to be intelligent <laughs> and do a little bit of research. And Leon Bignall, right, Wikipedia, yeah. busted for doodling. Oh, was it? And, and the thing is, we need parliament, and it's really important that we have all the legislation come through. But I'm kind of the sales guy, you know? Yep. I'm out there selling the tourism, selling the thing. So all the time I was a minister, I hardly got any questions from the opposition because yep. they know they'd ask me a question, I'd just tee off about how good things were going. Yep. So they'd be going after other portfolios. So the only way I could get a question up was to ask our backbench to ask me a question. Yep. And um, and away we'd go talking about how good the joint is. But um, look, it's <laughs> it's uh, the thing I miss is if I'm in parliament, I'm not in my electorate. Yeah. And I just yeah. put my, I've got a roof sign on. A lot of politicians don't do the roof sign anymore on the top of the car. I always have it on or for the whole four years in between elections. Because if you're going to be in the main street of Yankalilla yeah. doing your shopping at Foodland, you want everyone to know that you're in the main street of Yankalilla yeah. or you're at the cafe in Normanville or you're driving along the road and they see you coming forward. And, and I'm a big grown up in the country. I'm a big do the old one finger wave. Oh, man. I love that, it. Absolutely. I, th I think that's... And as a motorcyclist, yeah. everybody used to do the head nod or the yeah. wave. Yeah. And it has fallen away oh, side about in the last 10 it's years. It's un-Australian. It is. It's, it's un-baggy green. Mate, it is un-everything. It's yeah. un-humanitarian. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just saying g'day to somebody. It's like just walking down the street. I yeah. mean, if I'm walking down the street and somebody's walking past me, yeah. I will always say, g'day, yeah. mate, and yeah, just yeah. give a nod. Exactly. Hey, mate, how's your day? Or something like that. But, and the people that don't, I just get this serial yeah. killer feeling. I there's know. something wrong with this. Why won't you say hello to me? Why won't you acknowledge me? Yeah. But there's, there's a beach etiquette. Do you know that, like, if you go down to the beach before sort of 8 or 9 in the morning and everyone's doing the power walk, g'day, mate, how you going? 
go down to the beach after nine o'clock, people walking on the beach, no one says good day. No because it's like yet. a club before eight or nine in the morning. But yep. um, yeah, I love the old uh, the old good day and just having a wave and just, just being out there. So, you know, Parliament takes me away from all of that stuff. Yeah. So you can't beat being out there, having an ear to the ground and, and listening to people. Well, look, you, you, you're definitely still making an impact, I think, and um, and uh, definitely keep up your social media side of things and keep the personality in it because it's refreshing to see. And uh, and I know, you know, one particular mate of mine, Luke, he said to me, he goes, if you've got a politician on there, mate, you better make sure they're not fucking boring. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I don't reckon you're a boring bloke, so I no, really appreciate the time. Really appreciate and, it, Nick, uh, and yeah. well done on the uh, on the show. It's, uh, it's awesome and, um, yeah, really appreciate you having me on. No problem, mate. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> no worries. Thank <laughs> you.